So we're just about to start the boat up and head down to the new location, which is basically down that way, about 100 metres. Let me show you on the screen where we are right now in the marina here. We actually only need to come down to here, so it's not a huge trip, um, but we'll go out and do a bit of a burst up here as well, get some speed up and put a bit of load on the engine. So let's get her fired up and ready to go. Brewpeg was a sunken fishing trawler that was stripped out and ready for the scrapyard. She's just completed a 10 year rebuild that's brought her back to life. With the help of volunteers and funded by our Patreons, community and subscribers, she'll be crewed by passionate people from around the world. If you'd like to be involved and support the project, please consider joining us on Patreon or subscribe to the channel. There's a link in the description below. What a lovely hydraulics lovely squirty squirt and give it two for good sakes perfect Doink. clear prop So I just started it, forgot to check the throttle, and it started at about 1200 RPM. So that was a bit of excitement. Perkaluk's getting the um, drone up in the air. So the guys are just outside uh, doing the bow lines. We've got one stern line and then we've got a springer. So we're going to leave the springer till the end. And uh, yeah, we're going to walk the boat out because we're pretty tight and we've got a bit of prop walk. So we're just going to walk the boat out till we, so we're halfway out. And then, then we're going to start putting some power down. In a boat like Brewpeg that doesn't have a bow thruster, it takes a bit of grunt work to get the boat to spin around in a short space. So let me walk you through how we spin Brewpeg round in a very tight spot. It's all about putting the rudder from left to right and putting the gearbox in forward and reverse and giving it bursts in either way. So here you can see rudders going hard to port or left as we're going astern or backwards and then flicking it around the other way going hard to starboard. Put the gearbox in forward, there's a bit of a delay. There we go, it's hooked in. So put a little bit of forward throttle in, push the back around. Now go the other lock, put it in reverse, give it a burst, put it into forward, rudder the other lock, give it a bit of a burst in forward, and then we should be clear enough now, we can straighten up, Most excellent, sir. and leave the dock. Driving by Braille, thank you. So sped up nice and quick, this is what that manoeuvre looks like, going in reverse, bit of forward, bit of backwards, bit of forward, bit of backwards, another bit of forward, and you're done.
a line on so I can use it to pull the boat in. I've got a bit of tide pushing me downstream. Yeah, we can't get on the I decided it wasn't safe for the guys to jump off, so I wanted to go around rather than risk the fellas falling into the water. So using the same technique of forward and back, forward and back and opposite lock, we can bring the boat sideways without the need for a bow thruster. We're in, so, bit of a visual down there. Let's go down and um, the boys are tying the lines off, putting fenders in. Let's go down and get rid of the engine. We don't need that right now. Noise. With the boat in, we can tweak the lines to bring her closer to the dock. Our old home down the end there where the big catamaran is and the new place that we are located is upstream a little bit next to the commercial trawlers which for us is kind of a lovely thing so Trev's just um, tying up the shore power boat's hooked up little monkey realizing she's in a new spot First time that she that we moved it when she was walking around. Yeah. Like right now. It was straight away she's kind of into it. She killed up in the chair beside me and just stayed there the whole time. While the engine was on. Nosy. A new spot for a minute, darling. It's got so much nicer. Round boats that I like. Bex just zoomed down to the dinghy on the scooter. This is him bringing the little race truck back. We're gonna go and pick up the ute, so uh, we need the dinghy up here now. Flat water, flat stick. You think we can work some growth again? Not lost a couple of knots of boat speed. Yep. Later that night, a new trawler came in. Ropes were pulled. Rain was worn. Good times all round. We got bucket loads going on this week. We need to get a whole bunch of aluminium and stainless out of the back of the ute because that is going to form part of our new uh, power system. It's going to become a box that our lithium batteries sit in. So let's crack on, get that done. So we grab some um, one inch box or 25 mil box, three mil wall thickness, um, one eighth of an inch wall thickness. This is going to form the basis of our battery cabinet thing. And then we have a sheet of one mil aluminium, which is going to be the skin that goes over the whole lot. Um, we don't have to try and, so basically the rules are we have to have these lithium batteries in a box. We don't have to contain fire or anything like that because the chance of fire with lithium ion phosphate is very, very, very low. And we're going to have multiple control systems in place to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, we just have to protect from gas. So if there is an off-gassing event, this gas-proof box allows us to basically vent it outside the boat. And we thought we were going to be building this box this week. However, we're still tossing up between using genuine Victron batteries or a different type of battery for the Victron system. And those batteries are different dimensions to each other and therefore the box needs to be different. So until we can lock that down, we can't build the box. So we're storing the alloy on the boat. 
So it's going to be a busy three weeks coming up. There's so much to organise in the background with the GoFundMe being so successful. We had our uh, Patreon roundtable made lots of decisions. And the, the live feed with uh, all the donors and, and contributors to the GoFundMe has already happened. Um, so um, we'll put that up for you guys so you can see that. Uh, so we know, we know what we're doing with the money and now we've just got to sort out the system. So Damien's been talk, 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 really, really busy. <laughs> uh, really busy doing that. Yes, that is my, um, my text has come through. It's really fluffy. Um, uh, Damien's been organising that with the guys. He's going to introduce you to the team that's going to be doing this install with us and helping us all parts of it. Duncan will be here by the time you see this. Um, next episode you'll see what he's up to. We'll have people coming and going quite a bit. I will have been down in Brisbane. No, I wouldn't. I'm heading down tomorrow actually. Um, I'm heading down for some procedures for my health to get me uh, ship shape, hopefully. And uh, we'll talk more about that later. So next, Dan's going to take you through uh, what Damon and him discussed and he's going to introduce you to the team. There's been a couple of comments where people are nervous we're going to get a whole bunch of new gear, stick it in that battery box and then pretty much set fire to it again like we did with the last lot. And we really, really don't want to do that. So we've assembled a team and what a team it is. We've got Damon Chapman. He enjoys romantic novels and collecting late 18th century pottery from Uruguay. Damon is the electrician that's going to design the system and fit it to the latest and greatest regulations. Our next contestant, Dedrick Ryan. Legend has it he once caught a kangaroo booking an overseas holiday on his credit card. He's in charge of the AC revamp and working with Damon to program the Victron ecosystem to match the genset and charge parameters. Contestant number four, Heinrich Steger. He's a student of electrical wizardry and comes with an encyclopedic knowledge of Victron systems. So he's double checking system design and rubbing simulations on what the solar output should be so we can match that back to what we're seeing on the boat. And finally, the Grandmaster, Duncan Campbell. Some say he was once engaged to the Queen, and that he has a pet lobster named Cedric. He's responsible for connecting Brunette, our vessel monitoring system, with the new Victron power system, so that we can see every aspect of the boat and the onboard energy from the bridge. One of the challenges that we have with designing the new system is integrating just how much solar Brewpeg has. We have 5 kilowatts on the roof, which is a staggeringly large system for a boat of this size, and it's abnormal to have something with this much solar on board. Normally a boat of this size might have 1, possibly 2 kilowatts, and this is why it's critical we get the system design right. So two days ago I sat down with Damon, and we went through the whole boat, top to bottom, solar, everything, batteries, inverters, wiring, sizes, where it's going, everything. And we basically came up with a plan that we think is going to work. The system is quite substantially bigger than what Victron or us initially planned for. So what are the variables that we need to factor in? Or said another way. Why is this so hard? That's a very good and mature way of asking that question, Damien. So, we have a generator which can put in 400 amps from a charge current. We have a main engine alternator which, when we do an upgrade, which I'll talk to you about in a moment, can put around about 150 amps into the system. We have a solar system, let's call it PV, photovoltaic, that can put in conservatively 150, but it can probably do more than that, maybe up to 180 amps, theoretically up to 200, but we can see about 150 in the real world, and we have shore power. Shore power, and that can do 150 amps as well. Amps, there we go put amps on that one as well. All right, so when we combine all of that up, we get a number of 850 amps, which is too much. Now, why is it too much? And it's our battery over here. So we've got a big battery. So we'll draw a big one. So we've got a negative and a positive, so we know. That can take, uh, let me think about this, it can discharge 800 amps safely and it can uh, charge 400 amps safely. Now most people think that lithiums can just absorb as much charge as you want to give them and they'll discharge as much as you want to give them and it's not true. Lithiums die if you charge them wrong. They're pretty forgivable They'll do a lot that you can you wouldn't be able to do with say lead acids, but if you overcharge them, you will start to damage them. So the batteries that we're looking at, they have a specific rating of 800 is our output, 400 is our input. Now, as you can see, we can do that with our generator alone. Let me just put this down here so you can 
So we can put uh, 400 amps in from the generator. This is the alternator. And if we start getting some of these other ones combining, like say the, the uh, photovoltaic and the main engine, between those two, they can do 300 amps. So if we are steaming away at night, the generator's not running, we'll be putting in around about 150 amps. In the middle of the day, that number's gonna go up to about 300 amps. If we're sitting at anchor and we turn everything off, it's nighttime, the solar's not working, the main engine's turned off, we're not plugged in on shore power, we can charge using the generator at 400 amps. And when we're just sitting at the wharf, we'll be able to pull 150 amps via the shore power continuous. And then in the daytime, we'll be able to top that up to 300 amps. So we've got a huge amount of charging capacity, but the issue is, is that we have to make sure we don't go over this 400 amps. So we're using the smarts of Victron to be able to stay under that limit, even though we've got the ability to well exceed that limit if everything was running at once. Now, prior to the GoFundMe, we had to figure this out ourselves. We don't have the level of Victron knowledge on board the boat to be able to solve this ourselves. And we couldn't afford to take on experts in their field that can do this for us. So the GoFundMe has been transformational. Up until now, we've had to figure this all out. And as you see, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But with the team that we've got on board, we're going to be able to sort this out and have a system that's incredibly robust and something that's going to be absolutely up to the standard of what we need. It's going to be up to the Australian standards, but apart from that, it's also going to be up to the standards of the researchers that we're hoping to have on board the boat. So we're going to be able to deliver 16 kVA of clean filtered power. So not generator supplied power, that's going to be clean battery and inverted power, which is as good as you can get. So if they've got any really sensitive equipment and things like that, they're going to be able to run it without the machine having a freak out because the power quality isn't good enough. Now that Damon's done the walkthrough of the boat, there's a couple of small jobs we need to get finished while we wait for the parts to arrive on the new system. We need to get our air-cooled generator back up and running. It's a pretty minor job to get this thing up and running, but we're also going to be keeping this in the boat. So that if everything else fails, the new generator, the Victron system, the batteries, the main alternator, if everything goes down, we have the ability to make five kilowatts of power and limp the boat home. Now the new generator, the big generator that we're going to be installing in the boat, there's two things I need to show you. One of them's on the boat and one of them involves a dinghy ride. On the rear deck of Brewpeg, right behind the two doors for the saloon, there's this part of the deck in here. We're gonna be cutting a hole in there, lowering the new genset down, it'll sit straight onto its mounts here, and then we're gonna weld that plate that we cut out, we're gonna weld it back in, and that's gonna be how the genset gets fitted to the boat. Okay, I promised a dinghy ride, so let's go. So where we're located, we're at a fishing wharf, which is not very far from the marina. So let's go and have a look at the fuel dock. Now we need the fuel dock to be able to put the new generator in, and that's because they can drive a forklift down the fuel dock and load straight onto the back of Brewpeg. Now one of the challenges that we have with this fuel dock, it's quite high above the water. So we have to be able to get a forklift to drive down and sort of drive along those barges and then stick it underneath the roof, between the roof and the side deck of Brewpeg. If I stand up, you can kind of see there's not a huge amount of room when we do that. So we may have to come up with another solution, which might be this. This wharf here, now, although it looks very high at the moment, it is low tide, very low tide. So when it's a high tide, we think there might be a little bit less distance between the top of the wharf and the top of Brewpeg's side deck. So we may be able to squeeze the generator in using this wharf and a forklift. Last episode, we mentioned that Victron was looking at coming on board as a sponsor to Brewpeg. Part of this process that we're going through with Victron at the moment is figuring out what we need to do with batteries. The reason we're changing the batteries out and not using these uh, lithiums that we have here is these lithiums are not able to be compliant in a marine setting. So not, I mean, they're fantastic lithiums. They've really, really impressed us with how good these have worked. Um, and we have no qualms about these batteries. We can't make them stick to the Australian standards that we need to get to in order to have this system up to the code. So these ones are gonna be replaced. We don't know what we're gonna do with these ones yet. We'll probably, maybe electric dinghy or something. Chuck your comment, ideas in the comments. We'd love to know what your thoughts are. Um, but we will be taking these out of the system and we'll be putting in some new batteries. One of the things we have to build for these new batteries is an enclosed box. So to get it up to the standard of the marine code in Australia, you can't have your lithiums just sitting 
out in the open like this. They have to be in a gas tight box and then you have to have a vent going from um, the highest part of that box up to the, the top of your boat or out to the side or somewhere. It has to be able to vent. So if ever one of those batteries has a, a meltdown and it basically off gases, there's an excess of gas in that box and needs to be able to vent to the outside of the boat. Now I've quizzed the guys on this because I thought initially I thought, well, maybe it's a fire thing. Maybe the batteries, the box has to enclose if, if there's a battery fire because there's a lot of misconceptions around lithium. And I'm going to, in a future episode, we're going to really go into this detail because there's a lot of myths about lithium. People think lithium batteries, there's, there's one chemistry. There's not. There's lithium ion, which is a really high energy density battery, and that's what uh, electric vehicles and things like that use, and your cell phones and laptops, drills, all of that stuff. Most people have got lithium ions all over their house. They're pretty safe. Like It's very rare that they actually have, a, have an issue, but when they do have an issue, they're the ones that catch fire. And that's why you see you know, uh, cell phones that have swollen up or electric vehicles that have caught fire and things like that. Um, they, in terms of statistics, they're an incredibly safe battery, but when they do go, do go wrong, they basically catch on fire. Lithium iron phosphate, which is what these lithiums are and what almost all store, stationary storage, so um, the lithiums that we're getting, um, any of the, the big batteries they install for power grids, that sort of thing, they're almost always lithium iron phosphate. And the difference is you don't get quite as much energy storage per, you know, per square meter of, of battery, but they're miles, miles safer. There's lots of videos out on the internet of people driving nails through battery cells and they, nothing happens. They just, they just don't do anything. They're incredibly safe chemistry. So if you're concerned about you know, lithiums being a problem, you have to be very specific about the chemistry you're talking about. And if you've got the right chemistry and the right system, so you've got a box and a, a vent and everything like that, you're incredibly safe. And they're the standards that we're going to be working to on Brewpeg. All right, we need to deal with this. A couple of weeks back, you saw these uh, drawers get installed. We've still got chaos everywhere. We need to go through and figure out where we're putting stuff. These drawers are all empty. There's nothing in them. But these drawers are chock a full. We need to organize how we want to have our tools. We also need to go through and figure out what tools we're going to keep and what we're going to bin. Now, the reason being is tools don't last on this boat. Salt water kills things. So we've got a lot of hand tools. And we've got some really amazing tools. Like we've got lots that were donated to us, some awesome pliers and things that have been given to us over the years. But nothing lasts in a saltwater environment, so we either need to go through and decide what's being kept, what's being maintained, and what needs to be replaced. And this drawer is also too full to close easy, so we need to start separating some things out. Yeah, right. You built this one. Bert's going to crack on and get the uh, new injector and fuel system up and running on this. Over the back here, I'm going to get the big aluminium box that's haphazardly thrown under the bench. I'm going to get that mounted properly so that we can do the final cleanup and get rid of all of this. So the easiest way to mount the shelf is to use a bit of 50 by 50 by 6 mil aluminium angle. I'm going to chop this up into three lengths, bolt it to the ribs, set the shelf on top and rivet the shelf to this angle. Right, now that we've got three of those cut, time to start getting them into the boat. The tiny, tiny nozzle. See how it's going out on the angle? Like, you see it like that? Yeah. It's going at an angle. It must be a bit of shit in it. So, yeah. Yeah. it's a little file thing on that weird thing. Oh, yeah. When we finish, we'll clean it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Using the Oxy torch that was donated by Mark, we're using a bit of heat to get the old fitting out of the old injector so that we can mount it into the new injector. So whatever your heat's going to expand, so you want to try and expand the, the female thread, so the male thread, if you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Edges will always take more heat. You can work it in using the edges. So you want to give it a second to go away. Use the other end and just jiggle it down. 
All right, there's a bit of chaos on this bench. Oops, I broke his injector. Burke's fitting a new injector. Um, because someone tried to weld the old injector, won't name names, but new injector's going in. We've got a new solenoid that's going in the fuel pump. This is the fuel pump. That's getting fitted as well. Well, that's happening, I'm under the bench, bolting these guys over in the back there so that we can fit the um, big storage box. Thanks. Oh, the bed melt. Yeah. Good position. Thanks. Molded by eye. Oh yeah, that's gonna work. Upside down in a fucking thing with no straight edges. Measure down from the table? Yeah. There you go, measure down from the table. Good ride. There's a big assumption about the table level. After much faffing around and then realising I'd filmed my bum for most of it, this was the result. Alright, box is in. So we've got these three guys bolted to the rib right at the very back. Uh, I just need to trim those back. Any idea how to stop the, you know, the piece that goes up on the front of the injector? Yeah. That wants to fall down every, every time I hold it that way? Um, put a bit of, like, cop coat or something on it. Okay. So new injector fitted and bolted down. Diesel high pressure fuel line bolted into the new injector. Solenoid replaced in the fuel pump and the fuel pump fitted back into the engine. The berculator is looking for an art. He needs three for the fuel pump we've got two of them. We're not 100% sure where the other one's gone. It was sitting on the engine but it's now no longer on the engine. Yep. Yep. Right. Yep. While I'm finishing the last of the alloy box mounts, Burke's emptying the oil out of the little gen set. It's been run in now, so we're going to put some new oil in. So our not so permanent solution, just a water bottle. Guys are using a bottle for the fuel return line until it can be plumbed back into the non-pressurised fuel supply pipe. So Burke's now going through and bleeding the injector line so that we can fire this wee thing up. Is good now? Yeah. Okay, nip that up. I mean, it's quite... Like, follow me. That's okay, just as long as you've got it coming out of the slide. Yeah. With the diesel lines now bled, nothing left to do but check it's disconnected from the boat from an electricity point of view, and then start it. You can hear it running a bit rough and it's pulsing up and down in its RPM. It's mainly air in the injector line. As soon as that goes, the engine runs clean. Apart from a couple of exhaust leaks, Gen Set signed off. Right, we've just been into town and we've driven everywhere and nothing's open because it's Easter Friday. So we're going to half finish this job. Now, I know you're thinking that's not what we do on Brewpeck. I understand. I get that. But we're going to have to do it this time because there is no way to get the parts. All right, I need to. This thing's been trimmed off. You can see those mounts now disappeared. I need to bolt the uh, alloy box to those brackets. Now, I'm not going to be able to put a latch that holds this up. So right now... It's going to sit down like that, which is going to drive me insane, which is a good thing because it'll drive me nuts enough to go and fix it as soon as I can possibly get the parts. One! Ah! 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 Two! Ah! 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 Right, let's nip those down so that it doesn't move while we go and drill the rest. If you're doing lots of riveting, do yourself a favour, go on eBay and spend 20 bucks and get one of these things. It's a drill riveter. They are phenomenal. They will save you so much time. Easy as that. I haven't got a latch on that door yet, but that's where it sits. So, it doesn't quite come all the way down. It hits our hydraulic tank, but you know, whatever. We'll get over that. But it works quite well. That's going to be lovely for storage. The box is in. And I'm completely shattered. This wee 5 kilowatt generator over here, the air-cooled one. We're so close to getting it working, you know, like we're probably 98% ready to go. It's wired in, it runs, 
we've got to fix a couple of teething issues with the exhaust like basically we need to put a flap at the top we need to fix an exhaust leak we need a ball, ball valve in the s-bend so if water gets in we can let it out um, we're pretty confident we've solved the um, the fuel issues now so we think that's sorted uh, you know there's a lot of compromises to make an air-cooled stationary generator like that work in a boat like brewpeg it is our backup generator so if we ever need that we're going to have a new generator soon that a big generator that's going to run the boat it's going to be a water-cooled 1500 rpm generator kubota with a leroy soma alternator um 19 kba so quite a quite a big powerful one that's going to be in the boat very soon within maybe a fortnight at this rate um we're also going to have 200 uh, sorry 150 amps capable coming through our, our main engine alternator we're going to have um, 400 through the generator we're going to have 150 through the solar and 150 through shore power so there's four sources of energy before we ever need to rely on that thing yes i know it's an air-cooled stationary generator and everything like that but it's not uncommon to have air-cooled generators in boats not necessarily in recreational boats it's more a commercial boat thing a water-cooled generator is much better and i'm the first to admit that and all that sort of stuff but it was never it was never our primary generator so these are little test strips that we use for our coolant daniel griffith sent us a pack of these thank you daniel they're awesome um, basically what they do is they allow you to figure out if you've got enough coolant as in the the concentrate stuff in the fluid that's in your engine you need to have enough in order to protect your liners ours is slightly down a little bit we need 50 percent and we've got about 35 or 40 based on the strip so i'm just going to add another liter or two of this stuff we've got 90 liters in the whole system so it's not going to take a lot to top it up but we need to do that and i've designed this system to be as awkward as possible to put new coolant in With the concentrate added, the engine's back up to the right percentage and we're looking after the motor for the long term. I need to wash the engine now.